If you're a big swim team and you like to order a lot of gear, maybe you ought to check out Swim Outlet Team Division for these reasons. Swim teams receive a 10% discount on bulk orders. Swim teams or organizations get an 8% commission on referred sales. You'll also like their customization services, which is affordable and available at all times during the year for all team gear. With over 50,000 items in stock, you can get most anything you want. Swim Outlet Team Division. You need to try it out. You'll be glad you did. This is the Morning Swim Show for Thursday, November 13th, 2013. I'm your host, Jeff Cummings. Asa Kaimig is not a superstar swimmer. He doesn't have Olympic medals or world records, but he does have the drive to win, and he's training towards the goal of multiple medals at next summer's Transplant Games. Like me, you've probably never heard of the Transplant Games before. It's an event that brings together not only those who have received organ, tissue, or bone mineral transplants, but their donors as well. Kaimik is organizing a fundraiser to pay for his expenses to travel to the event in Houston. And to talk about that and more, we welcome Asa to the show via Skype from Lynchburg, Virginia. Asa, it's good to see you. How are you today? Doing well, Jeff. Thanks, uh, thanks for having me on. I appreciate the opportunity to be uh, incorporated into the swimming world today. Well, you're going to be incorporated into a lot more. I, I know we, I uh, got to talk to you via email last week and wrote an article about your uh, fundraising efforts on swimmingworld.com. So it's nice to see you in person and kind of get a little bit more in depth uh, with your story. And along that line, before you had told us about the Transplant Games, I will admit I never, ever heard of it. When was the first time that you had heard of it? Well, it, like you said, you hadn't heard of it. Most people hadn't, haven't, uh, haven't heard of it. Uh, I first heard about it back in 2008. Uh, as you know, I had my, my kidney transplant in 2005. And in 2008, I was kind of offered the, the opportunity to compete for Team Maryland. Uh, the games were going to be held up in Pittsburgh, not too far from uh, my hometown of Baltimore. And at that time, I just had a lot going on. I was finishing up high school. Physically, I wasn't where I needed to be to compete at a competitive level, you know, three years after my transplant. And then just mentally, I, don't, I wasn't really, I wasn't ready to get back into the whole athletic competing atmosphere that I had grown up in. So 2008 was the first time I, I really had heard about the transplant games, um, but I pushed it to the side. And it was something I put on the back burner um, until this past summer when it kind of kind of came to the the front of the agenda for me and when I heard more about it. So this uh, it's something I've known about for a while, but I've really gotten more information on it uh, since this, this past summer. So basically you've had five years of this excitement building up. So I guess this is kind of like the Olympic Games for a lot of people. I mean, you've had the, all this time to, to finally, you know, get your chance to, to um, participate in this event. It, absolutely. It's something that when you read about it, it's exciting. It's exciting to know about, but at the same time, you think about putting yourself in that situation. And, and like you said with the Olympic Games, it's, you know, building up that anticipation. And for me, I, I can't wait for, for Houston next summer. The, I'm just, I'm ready to go now. I could go out there and I could go out there and race right now. And I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm excited. It's, it's, it's going to be an incredible opportunity. Well, that athletic drive that, um, uh that you, I can tell it's in you if you're ready to go today. I mean, that, that, that is something that's universal across every sport. It's not just in swimming. So it's good to see that. To talk a little bit first about, um, we'll come back to your athletic background. First, I want to talk about your fundraising efforts. You said that you need to raise about $1,300 for travel expenses, hotels, and everything about like that. Um, how close are you, you to that right now? Well, when we, we spoke last week, I was about 50 percent of the way to my fundraising goal of thirteen hundred dollars um i've gotten a little bit more a few more donations since then and i'm probably in the 75 percent to 80 percent range right now i'm almost to my goal um i'm not quite there yet but um i'm pretty um and really it's just um from all the publicity that i've been receiving and it's really helped. It's it's helped with my fundraising efforts so far. So I'm getting there. I'm not there yet, but I'm almost there. I'm close. Well, you got about six, seven months now before you have to really start thinking about making that plane <laughs> reservation. <laughs> yeah, I've got I've got a little bit of time left. There's no uh, there's no time deadline right now. I've got, I'm I'm in cruise control right now. Well, I want to talk about your journey to I suppose, for lack of a better term, being eligible for the transplant games. 
Um, you said you got a kidney transplant in 2005. Tell us about the circumstances that led to that. Absolutely. Well, born in 1990 with a hereditary kidney disease called Alport syndrome. Uh, basically, the kidney's main job is, you know, they're a filter. They're a filtering system. It's kind of like a colander when you're washing out vegetables or fruit when you buy from the store. That's, that's the main role and function of your kidneys. And what my disease that I had, outward syndrome, it kind of kept the kidneys from performing at their full potential. So most of the time, you know, the average person, their kidneys would be functioning at 100%, and I might have my kidneys functioning at 60 65%. So I was born with Alport syndrome. I'm one of six siblings. Of the six siblings, four of us actually have the disease. It was passed down from my mom, who actually uh, received it from her father, who uh, died, ended up passing away from it. And so that's that's where it started. It's, it's, it's been something that's with me my whole life. And it was just one of those things that, you know, I couldn't control the circumstances. and. Uh, eventually, in the fall of 2004, my uh, my kidney started to fail. My condition got worse. Uh, up until that point, I really didn't I really didn't take life as serious as most people should. You know, I didn't really give a second thought to anything. Um, but when you have something something so uh, devastating and tragic like this come into your life, it kind of it kind of brings you at home and it knocks you down a few pages. Kind of brings a little bit of humility into your life. So after, after the fall of 2004, it was right around that time, uh, my condition really, really, really got worse. Um, early 2005, I was to the point where I wasn't eating. I, I looked pale. I had lost over 100 pounds. And it just, it was a tough time in my life. It's, 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 something, it's, it's something that when I look back on, I'm thankful for because it's an opportunity to grow and it's who I've become. But... During that time period, it was just it was an uncomfortable time. I didn't, you know, I didn't know if I was going to wake up the next day. I didn't look forward to waking up the next day. It was, it, you could say it was a depressing time of my life, and really, it really was. Um, it was just, it was, it was a tough situation. Um, but by you know, by the grace of God, I got through it. You know, I was, it was to a point where I was on my deathbed, and you know, within two weeks, I, I got that the phone call that most people wait for, but not like yet. Um, and the doctors had found a donor for me. It was a man from my church, and it was, it was, it was definitely it was one of those where you sit back and just you breathe a sigh of relief. So that's that's what my journey was up until 2005 with you know having kidney disease and really just facing life or death ultimately. Well, that's that's something that very few teenagers should no teenagers should have to go through through, and very two, very few teenagers come out. Um, as well as you have. How were you able um, after that transplant to uh, go on with life? Was it just kind of like this window had opened for you now? I mean, really, you, you look at that and, you know, like I said, it brings you down and humbles you. And I was like, man, this, this is big. That's, I can't just go on living an average life because there was nothing average about what happened to me. I can't just, you know, sit back and act like nothing ever happened because that's not that's not the case nothing didn't you know everything essentially um, and that I mean that surgery made me who I am and when you look at it the, the amount of responsibilities that I took on from that surgery you know I was all the medication that I had to take each day morning and night the medication I had to fill it I had to schedule doctor's appointments uh, blood draws regularly and this is consistently right after my transplant it was about five to six days a week I was getting my blood drawn and tested and then it kind of it kind of slowly went to three times a week two times a week you know once every two weeks once a month um, so it just the amount of responsibilities that you take on really it, it forced me to grow up but you know it wasn't necessarily a bad thing I missed a lot of things kind of the teenage years of my life but you know I don't regret any of it if I had to go back and do it all Again, go back and do it all again at heart because it, it made me who I am today, and I I couldn't be more proud of what I've come from and the story that I have from that. So it was it was a humbling experience. It made me who I am today, and this it, it kind of made me go to the go the extra mile and step it up when it came to my responsibilities and you know kind of being a mature adult. And you got to play lacrosse for Liberty University. We see all your accoutrements from that time. You got your jersey, you got some helmets back there. 
What, I mean, obviously, you know, when you don't have a healthy kidney, it kind of gets in the way of being an athlete. Um, mm -hmm. were you, when you were playing lacrosse in college, did you ever have any physical setbacks because of either the transplant or just, uh, you know, just how you had been living your life? Well, I mean, and I, I have an extreme, like, rare case. I've never had any problems with my kidneys. I've, I've had friends that have had transplants. Um, the, the other person that had the transplant the same day of me, he's had complications since his surgery. Uh, a lot of people I know that have had transplants have ultimately, they've had problems with their kidneys, with the medication they've taken. And, you know, by the grace of God, I've never, you know, God is so good that I've never had any of his problems. I've never had to go back to the ER um, I've never had to have biopsies done, and the big thing, the big kind of setback coming out of a transplant and then and starting college and playing college across was basically just being out of shape. Because I go from having a train in 2005 to you know going almost a year before being cleared to be physically active, um, and it wasn't really until 2007, 2008 when my uh, my kidney my kidney doctor actually cleared me to play lacrosse. You know, they didn't think it, I'd actually end up playing. They, you know, they kind of made a joke out of it. Um, but when I got the liberty, that was that was my biggest thing, being out of shape. But you know, like any college sport, you come in and you know you're working 24/7. So I I quickly got out of shape and got back into shape. So that was that was definitely the hardest part and the hardest setback was being just so overweight and out of shape and not able to compete on a physical level. Um, but it, it changed really fast. Yeah, you can't be out of shape and running back and forth on that lacrosse field. That's right. Well, uh, there's no lacrosse at the transplant game, so uh, you're swimming in the event. Uh, tell us what your swimming background is. Well, um, like, the, like the article on me mentioned, I, I don't have that extensive background of Michael Phelps. You know, we grew up maybe 10 minutes away from each other. We both swam at the Towson Swim Club. Um, but, you know, competitive swimming wasn't something that I did growing up. Growing up in Maryland, Maryland's just a hotbed for lacrosse, and I, I started walking when I was a little little toddler, and I had a lacrosse stick put in my hand. So I came. I come from the the lacrosse background, but at the same time, recreational swimming. I was always you know, four or five days a week. I was at the YMCA with all my siblings, and we had swimming lessons. We were swimming all, all the time, and I didn't really think about it then that there could be potential to use that, you know, later on in life. It was just something that being home, home still in, you know, four or five days a week, and I just didn't think anything of it. So, I mean, I came from a recreational background, and then after that, I mean, it was just, you know, when you grow up with six six siblings, six kids in the family, um, it's, it's competitive. So there was always, we were always looking for opportunities to compete against one another, whether it was swimming in the pool, lacrosse, card games, anything we did, we competed against each other. So... That's where the big uh, competitiveness comes from in me is, you know, having five siblings by my side that, you know, growing up we were competing with each other. So that's that kind of sparked uh, just a little desire in me, just, you know, always be good at what I do, you know, don't stop till your good is better and your better is best. So that was my motto that I kind of stuck by and, you know, swimming wise, you know, I didn't want to live with me in a race. I didn't want her telling her friends that. You know, I didn't want one of my brothers beating me in a race. It was just always that, you know, you don't want your other sibling bragging to all the friends that they beat you or rubbing in your face that they beat you. So it was definitely one of those things that either you run with the pack or you get left behind. So the swimming wise, that's that's where I am right now. I I've, I've been swimming all my life. I don't think I could. I couldn't hold my own with Michael Phelps or any of the big namers out there. Um, but I do know a thing or two about swimming, and I'm I'm okay in the water. I'm comfortable. Well, that's the first step. Well, we got to talk about your, uh, I guess, your association with Michael Phelps. Not many people can say that they were swimming with him, or at least they're not publicly saying that they used to swim with Michael Phelps when he was younger. You got any any dish on what he was like as a younger swimmer? Um, I mean. You know, grew up in the same area, but really, you know, didn't hang out that much. I didn't really know him from a personal level, but at the same time, it's just, you know, he's just one of those people that, you know, he's good in the water. That's, it's like, it would be me and Cross, him swimming. That's, that's just, that's his, that's his, his go-to. That's who he is and what he's good at. So, 
you know, it's just like sometimes when you, you let that celebrity status kind of carry over a little too far, at the end of the day, he's just another human being. Uh, he's just another he's just another person on the block. So that's 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 what it comes down to at the end of the day. We're all we're all just human. Well, I, I'm I'm sure that maybe you've uh, reached out to him asking for his support for your donations. I would I would think that's got to be the ultimate endorsement for Michael Phelps to send out a tweet or or something to say help out my my good friend Asa and his uh, goal to get the transplant games. Yeah, you know that like that's the ultimate support right there. If you have an Olympic champion like Michael Phelps, you know rooting you on and give a shout out then. That's the ultimate thing. So I've gotten I've gotten a little bit of support from this from my Bowman, um, but ultimately something from Michael Phelps would definitely that'd be over the top. It'd be it'd be the ultimate sponsorship right there, the ultimate support. Well, hopefully Michael is watching and and uh, hopefully he will help out in any way he can. I know he's a busy guy even in retirement, but um, any I bet you even the littlest amount of support would be great. Well, Asa, um, before we go, um, every show, at the end of every show, we submit our, our guests to the final five, even five questions we use to get to know them better. A couple of our questions are very swimming related, so I, and, and you being a recreational swimmer, it might be a little too inside baseball for you, so not to, I guess I'm mixing all my sports metaphors, but, uh, but I do want to ask you some uh, these five questions, and we'll start off with kind of a, uh, a combination of swimming and lacrosse. Which is easier, swimming or lacrosse? Um, I'd have to go with lacrosse just because I've been playing all my life. For me, swimming is a little bit tougher. Just you know, the technique, being in shape, you know, the mindset you got to have. That's a little bit tougher for me growing up playing lacrosse, knowing the game like the back of my hand. It, lacrosse is easier for me than swimming. Okay. Um, if you could have any job or career in the world to try out, what would it be? Any job in the world, I would have to say doing marketing and public relations for either Under Armour or working for Make-A-Wish's creative services department because when I had my transplant, I actually got a wish from Make-A-Wish. So two dream jobs would either be at Make-A-Wish or Under Armour. Well, it was really quick. What was your Make-A-Wish? Uh, Make-A-Wish, I actually got to go over to Belarus um, right below Russia to visit some friends there. Um, my family hosted uh, several children from Belarus, uh, kind of helped with the uh, Chernobyl Relief Organization, uh, so that we got to host um, children for uh, about about ten years, um, and through my wish, I was able to go visit them and their families in Belarus with uh, some of my family members. All right, that's nice. All right, getting back to the final five questions. On the opposite side of that, what's a career or job you would not like to try? Uh, McDonald's. It's one of those things you see a lot of articles on them about stuff that's in their food, yeah, just things that you know. A lot of people don't like eating their food's not healthy. I'm one of those places where, you know, some people will work there, some people love it, they enjoy it, it works for them. I don't I don't think it would work for me. I'm a good cook, I'm good at cooking, I enjoy the restaurant environment, uh, but I don't think I'd enjoy uh, working at McDonald's. Okay. Uh, this is a, a lacrosse question. What is the one rule in lacrosse that bugged you the most? That's a tough one. There's, they've, um, I'd have to say the stick rule change. They changed um, one of the stick rules uh, this past season, where you couldn't have a certain stringing type in your stick. Uh, it was a kind of a it was a U-shaped design, and they actually eliminated that rule that you couldn't have it come down after a certain length. And so that that was kind of the the one that bugged me the most because everyone their sticks strung that way, and it was kind of it was it was hard, you know, changing something that you're used to and readjusting to uh, a different type of throw. Yeah, I'm sure it was. All right, last question. Where do you like to go most for vacation? Um, I'm a big Florida guy. Um, my best friend has a house down in Daytona Beach, Florida. I've been down there three or four times. And it's just, I love the environment there. I love the warm weather. I love being tan. Um, I wish I could be tan year-round. Um, so I'd have to, I'd have to say go to, go to would be Florida, definitely, for sure. Well, maybe when you uh, finish your degree in communications there at Liberty, apply for a job in Florida. Uh, it's definitely, it's, it's, it's on the go-to, a uh, little vacation to celebrate the undergrad uh, completion. So hopefully hopefully a little, a little time in Florida before uh, going to Houston this summer. That would be great, too. That would be absolutely awesome. Well, Asa, thanks so much for joining us today, and uh, keep, us in, keep us posted on how the donations come in. 
Absolutely, Jeff. I appreciate the opportunity to come on with you guys. All right. Have a good day. Thank you. All right. So that's going to wrap it up for today's edition of the Morning Swim Show. We thank you for watching. I'm Jeff Cummings, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.